Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to a special episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today, we're going to explore the creativity of various individuals on the autism spectrum. Amazing how creative those of us whose brains are a little bit different can be. First, we're going to hear from Ian Hale, who lives some of the time in England, some of the time in Spain. And Ian is a real Renaissance man. He's a poet, he's an author, he's a public speaker, he's a researcher. And I think you'll find him quite interesting. Now, what I would like to know from you for our audience is how your different brain, let's call it autistic or Asperger's, or as you say, Asperger, um, how does it affect your poetry? A hundred percent. If I, if I, if I wasn't what I am, um, my poetry would be different. The first poetry book is called Emotional Exile, um, because that was the best title to describe my experience of being an Aspie, of being a Asperger's syndrome. Um, I've described the experience as like living inside a greenhouse. You, you can hear and see, um, you know, the, the way people are living and interacting and everything with each other. And the door is, is there so you, you know, there's a little bit of communication. But at the end of the day, you, you're still an outsider. And that, that's why I've called the book Emotional Exile. And the, the second book of poems um, is called Dance with the Desert. Dance with the Desert is is more, it's less autobiographical than um, emotional exile. It's more, it's more wistful, I think, and it's more, it's more descriptive, and it's more about the natural world as well as about my inner world, but also my experiences and what people have told me of of their inner worlds, whether they be different brained people or not. It's, it, it's a, a gentler book, The Emotional Exile, but they both had fantastic reviews from, from very, very, um, you know, important reviewers. Uh, one of them was kind enough to, uh, well, an English reviewer, in fact, for Dance with the Desert, compared me with, uh, Keats and T.S. Eliot. Um, I can only say I'm extremely flattered. Wow. And currently, I'm trying to write the the third of that intended trilogy because the the poetry books um, are supposed to be initially three, and I I want to write a lot more poetry books. I wanted to ask you what is one message that you would like all of our differentbrains.com viewers and listeners and readers, what is the one message that you, Dr. Ian Hale, would like to give them? When you come across someone with a different brain, try to find out how they communicate best. It, it might be by, they might play you a song that expresses their feelings. They might, they might do shadow puppeting on the wall that expresses their feelings. They, they, might, they might sing. I'm a great believer, for example, I think one of the, one of the things that uh, is really helpful, as far as I'm concerned at least, is to, is to sing in public. I mean, I'm not saying it's good, but it, it's a, a wonderful hobby and it, it helps with self-expression. Um, some differently brained people will, will draw and I've, I've met a number of those and express themselves that way. Um, the, the secret and what I, what I want to get over to everybody is that we are different, not inferior, that autism is not a disease, there is no cure, it's a different state of mind, it's a, a different perspective of the world, and it's as valid as anybody else's. 
And, and that includes anyone with a different brain, whether they be bipolar or schizophrenic or Asperger's or whatever else it is, they see the world from a different angle, respect that, learn from it, as they will learn from you. So the plea that I shout out to the world, listening, tolerating, tr communicating, sharing. Next, we're going to hear from a talented young man, Colin Eldred Cohn, who makes people laugh. He's a comedian, he's on the autism spectrum, and I remember first meeting him out in San Francisco at the ASCEND conference, he wants to help everyone whose brain might be a little bit different. What are you writing? Mostly, uh, mostly critical stuff like reviews of movies and comics. I have uh, I have an ongoing movie review uh, series called Real Snippets on my website, fishandcherries.com. But I'm also writing op-ed pieces and well some fiction, like The Fire Truck Who Got Lost. Well, how'd you first decide to become a writer? I honestly don't know if I ever decided. I think it was just always there. Like, I always was... I've been writing since preschool. Just, you know, not all of it very good. I have a chapter in my Asper Tools book about how important it is to harness the hyper-interests, some would call obsessions. Right. And I figure, I tell everybody, no matter what their brain is like, if you can, if you're lucky enough to find out what you really love and you can figure out how to make a living at it, and if what you do also can help or make happy other people, that's the perfect trifecta. You have a good time the rest of your life and you're never working. Have you figured out how to monetize your hyper interests? Ugh. I'm still working on that. At the moment, I'm I'm using my writing hyper interest to build up the resume. I'm in a on top of my uh, fish and cherries thing. I'm also doing some unpaid gigs for Fanbase Press, where I write uh, reviews for comics that uh, haven't come out yet. Yeah, ev every review is is one more notch on the resume, but it's also something I really love to do. Um, though for the past three years, I have been, I, I, I've been working under a grant for creative writers. So that's been one way I've monetized it. I found someone who's willing to pay me to write creatively. How did you gravitate toward comedy? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I, well, part of it is that I really like laughing. Um, but another thing is um, that's the easiest way to judge if someone likes your movie. That's kind of what I discovered in college. And uh, so, yeah, I just kind of started, uh, I get, yeah, it's hard to say because I've always had comedy in mind, but I don't know. I just always wanted to give people that same sort of pleasure that I get when I sit down in front of a good comedy. Now, was your family supportive in, in this? Um, yes, I would say so. I mean, early on, they had to tell me, like, no, you, you can't write full-time right out of college or right out of high school, which, I mean, harsh but fair. And, but as of late, they've been really supportive. And after my grant runs out, they're encouraging me to go part-time on a job so that I can focus on my writing. What advice would you have for um, a young person on the, how old are you, by the way, may I ask? I'm 28. You're 28. So let's say I'm in my early 20s. I'm watching this. 
what's the biggest advice you have for me? Say I'm 20 some odd years old, I'm on the spectrum, I haven't quite found my niche yet. What's the overall advice you would have for me? I would say it, keep trying, find something you really love, go for it, and find a good support network. Um, good support network of friends or family or mix because whether you know it or not, they will be helping you or whether they know it or not too. I mean, sometimes it's just you're with friends and that's when the best of you comes out. That's what I've found. Our next clip is from the dynamic duo, Taylor Cross and Kerry Bowers. This autistic young man and his mom have created the film Normal People Scare Me and the sequel Normal People Scare Me Too. Well, how did you guys get into this? That's your story, Taylor. Um, I think we kind of fell into it by accident, where a lot of the stories that do come from uh, How Normal People Scare Me was ultimately formed, um, they just sort of were happy coincidences. Well, what, what happened when you were just about to turn 15 years old? Oh, with that, um, it was a social skills group. Tried to pay money for uh, to getting toys for, you know, those with battered women and other families. And, and I wanted to pay this year. Well, Taylor, I had put Taylor into um, community service when he was eight years old as a way to help him with social skills. It was free social skills. I highly recommend that to people today because you must interact and you also must think about others when doing community service. And through the years, he did more and more toward the, um, the actualization of community giving. So when he was 14 and he perseverated on film, um, he came to me and said, Mom, this year I want to pay for the gifts for myself. How can I earn some money? And do you remember? Um, I said, what did I say? Do you remember? Um, you can clean the swimming pool. Uh, you can clean the swimming pool. And what did you say? I was like, uh, no, that was... Uh... I want to make some films and sell them. That's what he said. But that was after he went, ah, I don't think so. Yeah, I was acting very auteurish there. Well, he was acting typically teenager. I loved it. I mean, when he just gave me that. Ah, ah, ah. So um, people who know me think I immediately said, yeah, let's go make a film. Because my background is in entertainment law. I was a paralegal with Motley Crue, Kiss, Blind Melon. Of course I would say yes, right? Now, I gave him every reason why he, at almost 15 years old, could not make a film. You're too young, you haven't gone to film school, we don't have money, it's just not done that way in Hollywood. And we were in the car, and I looked at my son, and I saw him looking at me, believing everything I said to him. And through my brain, it went, do-do-do-do-do, and they said, you might never walk or talk. And I looked at him, and I said, Taylor, everything I said is a lie. And that is totally true. You can make a film. I don't know how to do it, but I'll help you. We're going to do it. Doesn't and, matter how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. And so, you know, Hacky, when, when we put out an intention into the universe, the universe responds. So we that night he came to me and said, I want to call it. No, people scare me. And how did you come up with that, Taylor? Oh, I saw it on a shirt. I saw it on a T-shirt. So we had a title, and a week later we met Joey Travolta, who agreed to become Taylor's mentor to make a short student film, which won quite a few awards at the Ultimate Student Film Festival, which picked up media, which turned into um, um, us actually engaging Joey to create the feature film, which became... You know, People Magazine, Scholastic Magazine, The Today Show, Geraldo, all that later became sort of a first of its kind for an autistic to interview 65 people with autism to create a film about autism for people with autism. That's just great. That's what's got to happen more and more. That's got to happen more and more. Now, um, what do you consider your skill sets, Taylor? Like, what do you feel like you're good at? You know, that's a really difficult question for me to answer. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, that, asking that myself recently, especially within the last month or so. Um, 
I view myself as someone who's actually naturally talented at giving a decent enough interview um, in learning how to prepare for it. Uh, let's see, what else am I pretty good at? Um, I'm also very good at being, you know, on point when I am required to be. Finally, let's hear from the amazing savant Michael Tolleson. Michael was diagnosed with autism later in life and uses his unique talents as a savant artist to create masterpieces that are so beautiful and it takes him just minutes. Now, our viewers are looking at your desk at your gallery there and behind you are some masterpieces. Were those all by you? Yes, everything behind me is by me. Uh, again, everything is less than an hour for me to paint. Uh, some of them are published pieces. They have been in different books. Uh, the the one piece that's just right over my shoulder at the bottom uh, is in a book by uh, uh, Dr. Tony Atwood. Uh, been there, done that, try this, uh, which is a Asperger's advice book. So, uh, I mean, I'm I'm having a wonderful life. It's uh, four years of just throwing myself out there. So, Michael Tolleson, if somebody who's watching this or taking this all in wants to Google you right now, wants to see you painting one of those things you paint in five minutes, where, where's the best place for them to go? Just Google Michael Tolleson or... Uh, I actually have my own YouTube channel. So you can go on YouTube, you can put in my name, so it's Michael Tolleson, T-O-L-L-E-S-O-N. Uh, you're going to find a variety of uh, videos. There are videos uh, where I'm on large stages. There's videos where I'm at conferences, benefits. But uh, the most interesting ones are I have, if you look up Love and Autism uh, under my channel, you'll see me create a five foot by six foot birch painting, much like the one over my shoulder with moonlight, uh, which I completed in 35 minutes. Wow, 35 minutes. It, it, it's it's crazy. I mean, uh, truly, I'm gonna tell you, Hacky, I'm a, I'm a vessel, I'm a vessel. And whatever goes through me, goes through me with the autism. I didn't train, I have, I have no reason to be able to paint the way I do. But I picked up a brush I could paint. And my third painting sold out of a Houston gallery for $4,100. So I have just been producing painting after painting after painting. No mistakes, nothing that goes in the garbage. And I don't even know what I'm creating. Now tell us how, how did you get into the painting? You can produce a masterpiece and sell them for a significant chunk of change, I might add, at your gallery. And you can do it in like 35 minutes. So tell us that story. Well, the, the beginning of it is I was in middle school and I, I was living in a small Texas town and about six, eight of the kids went off and we did a, uh, an art lesson with a teacher who did pastel portrait art. So we went and I created a green bottle with pastels. She looked at it and said, oh no, honey, there's no purple in the shadows. And I looked at what I had created and in my mind, there was purple in the shadows. So I put down my pastel and I quit. I just quit. There was no reason for me to do art. If I couldn't do art the way I saw it, I wasn't gonna continue. So, so let me get that straight. So you saw in your mind, when you looked at what you had painted, you saw purple shadows. They belong there. It just was supposed to be there. In fact, for any of my paintings, any of the stuff behind me, there's weird colors and weird places. But it works. It works because my mind sees it. And, it, and my autism creates through those colors. 
Now, you can get, like, the birches behind me. You can get away from it, and it reads as birches and snow. You get up close to it, there's pinks, there's lavender, there's blues. There's all sorts of things going on. But that's the way my mind sees it. And that's how I wanted to create. You bring up a very interesting aspect, which is we as a society, instead of trying to harness the hyper interests and the abilities, right away our first impulse is to make you like everybody else. Why doesn't your brain work the way everyone else's brain does? This is the one-size-fits-all mentality that our school system, our workplace, our society in general, they, they have to get out of it. They, they have to embrace that it's a wonderful thing that Michael Tolleson's brain works differently, so his art is unique, just as he is a unique human being. And you just so eloquently put it that your brain sees it like this, your process is like this, and the net result is obviously very good. So why do you have to be forced to go from being a lefty to a righty? Because the problem is that we like to create a gerbil wheel life for everyone. And we get up, we have breakfast, we go to work, we come home, we watch us, go to sleep, and we start it all over the following morning. And it's, that's fine. That's fine if you want to exist. But I think autism gives us the ability to go beyond existing. We can create, we can dream, we can be more. There's a reason why, why all the IT industries are full of, of Asperger's. It's because we dream beyond what is typically put in front of us and expected of us. And for whatever our gifts are, we need to utilize our gifts. We're not, we're different for a reason. We're different because we, we can go to the next step and be the hope of, of the world. But instead, we're socialized to think that this is the way you run a life. I, I'm in my mid-50s. I'm finding out I can paint. I'm finding out I can go on stage and I can inspire people. Now... In the, the typical world, I'm ready to retire, and I'm ready to, like, go somewhere and go fishing. I want to do that. I want to spend the, every second I have breathing, I want to go do, and I want to create, and I want to help. And that's, that's what we need to do. With every child, with every adult, with anyone who shows any interest in anything different, we need to say, hallelujah, go for it. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.